Yes. Good afternoon, sports fans. Today is October the 29th, 2020. And I, the divine King John the I of Bunas Countyus, have been entrusted with giving you the opening introductory lecture discussion of this era of modern absolutism. I have to tell you that uh, myself and the other World Civ teachers um, debated greatly over who would get to do this. Uh, fact of the matter is we had something of a knockdown drag out fight and of course yours truly prevailed. And so, uh, yes, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the nature of absolute monarchy. Uh, there was there's an era in European history uh, during which the major events of Europe were directed by certain individuals, absolute monarchs. And so this is something that had never happened before where uh, a certain a small number of individuals had had so much power uh, and to be honest, it will really never happen again uh, unless of course you include the dictators of the 20th century. But the, this is not these are not dictators. this is different. These are absolute monarchs. Uh, these are people who came into power through what was considered legitimate means, uh, through inheritance, uh, something of that nature. And then they took what they were given and expanded that power. Now, before we get into a discussion of the divine rights of kings, I'm sorry, of modern absolutism, we need to visit the divine rights of kings theory. Yes, the divine rights of kings theory, which if you don't happen to have that uh, in the back of your mind, let me be of assistance. There we go. And here it is, the divine rights of kings theory. And, you know, to fully understand this, you have to break it down into its component parts. Divine rights of kings theory. Uh, the king, by the grace of God. Now you say, what does that mean? Uh, I mean, all of this meant something. The king, by the grace of God. It means that the king was chosen by God. Now, for the uh, source of this theory, you could look no further than the Bible, the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9, uh, where the Apostle Paul speaks about the fact that uh, all the powers that be are ordained of God. And later on, it goes on to say, if you go against those powers, then the executioner uh, bears not his weapon in vain, meaning that God puts kings in power. And so, therefore... Uh, if God did it and you go against the king, then you are going against God. Secondly, the king is absolute in power. What does that mean? How much power is absolute in power? Well, theoretically, it literally means that the king has the power of life and death over his subjects. And not only entitled to uh, their lives, but their property as well for the good of the realm. But now the one that has always intrigued me about this is this part, sacred in person. A lot of people have a difficult time wrapping their head around sacred in person. Um, what does that mean? I remember when a long time ago in a land far, far away, when I was a child, um, there were only three, and I'm not lying. Actually, there, where I live, there were only two television stations, NBC and ABC. And every Sunday night, Walt Disney. Yeah, Walt Disney would present. Well, the name of the show was Walt Disney Presents. And they would put on, you know, cartoons or stories or this, that, and the other. And I remember one particular Sunday night, they presented the... I think it's by Robert Louis Stevenson, a, a story called The Whipping Boy. And The Whipping Boy is actually based on true incidents. You see, here's the problem. Um, members of royalty have children. And when they have children, those children 
are supposed to be taught, matured, brought up. But the problem is, you know, um, all children misbehave, except for my son. All children misbehave and um, somehow need some kind of correction. And of course, back then, they didn't have timeouts and things like that. The uh, primary way that children were corrected was through some kind of physical punishment, which in the case of the royal family would present a problem. Spanking the next king, not a good idea. And so, and what they did was they would give children of the royal family royal playmates. And when the child misbehaved, they would physically punish the child's playmate, hence the term the whipping boy. And yeah, but I mean, so sacred in pop person, what does that mean? It literally means that the king's physical personage, his physical being, should be considered an holy relic and holy, you know, something that uh, is not to be casually touched. For example, my favorite example of an absolute monarch is this guy. This is, I'm sure you can identify, this is Louis XIV of France. Yeah, King Louis XIV of France, the Sun King, Le Roy Soleil, uh, I am the state. Notice the Florida Lee in his beautiful robes. Uh, notice also that the man is about 70 years old. He's actually only a few weeks from dying but he has got some nice legs yeah which is one of the advantages of having your portrait painted over taking a photograph but yeah uh louis the 14th was prime example of an absolute monarch prime example of the idea of sacred in person you see louis the 14th lived in the palace of versailles you know, a beautiful little humble home for him and 10,000 of his closest friends, not lying. And every day, everything that Louis XIV did was a ritual. <clears throat> In fact, every morning, and you can check this out, every morning when Louis XIV arose, 150 members, not, not common people, not common servants, uh, 150 members of the nobility stood in line and counted it their honor to help Louis the 14th do his shall we say morning duties now if you have trouble understanding what morning duties are think of what you do in the morning to get yourself prepared for the day in terms of personal cleansing etc etc Yes, the royal potty is ready, sire, and then all the cleansing. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sacred in person. You were not to touch the king. You were not to turn your back on the king. You were to address the king uh, with terms like your grace, your majesty. You were not to use foul language in front of the king. Uh, the king simply occupied a higher place in the grand order of things than you ever considered doing. And so, yeah, sacred in his person. You didn't touch him. And, you know, Louis XIV, uh, Louis XIV, he had an interesting childhood. Now, he built for himself the Palace of Versailles, which I'm sure your teachers will be showing you later. If you notice on the assignment page that you have there, I actually have a picture of the Hall of Mirrors. Um, and I've been there, it's a beautiful place. Um, but anyway, uh, Louis XIV, um, when he was a child, uh, he uh, had to endure several attempts on his life. He lived in the Tuileries Palace in Paris. I mean, it was a it was a castle. I mean, it was a palace. And of course, much, much better than what the average Joe had. But still, it was in the middle of Paris. Paris smelled because it didn't have any sewers. 
and that was crime, there were beggars, and then, of course, there were attempts on the life of Louis XIV. And so, yeah, he moved out. Well, let's get back to the divine rights of kings theory, shall we? And so, yeah, sacred in person. Hopefully we're familiar, we understand that now. His body is something that uh, you're not supposed to touch. Endowed with extraordinary wisdom. What does that mean? Well, it means this. Rule number one, the king is always right. Rule number two, when the king is wrong, refer back to rule number one. That's what it means. And that's it. Endowed with extraordinary wisdom. And finally, responsible to God alone. Meaning that according to this theory, which to be real honest is taken in various levels, but this is the central point. This is the beginning of the idea of absolute monarchies. Uh, but responsible to God alone means that when the king commits those acts, such as taking someone else's property, such as taking someone else's life, um, in theory, uh, the king will be held responsible by none other than God. No court on this earth will try him. In theory, I mean, we know that uh, this is not always true. For example, Charles I of, of England was beheaded. We Louis the Sixteenth will be beheaded. Um, Peter the Third, uh, the husband of Catherine the Great, will be beat to death. Um, yeah, but anyway, let's let's just quickly uh, have a uh, look at some of the more important names. Uh, of these absolute monarchs, shall we? We've already visited with uh, Louis the Fourteenth. Uh, the next one is this guy, Peter the Great. Peter the Great of Russia. Yeah, Peter the Great. Um, the the thing that you need to remember about Peter the Great, long and short, is simply that Peter the Great. The old saying goes, "Dragged Russia kicking and screaming into the modern era." The force of his will, and pretty much that was it, was able to make Russia, convert Russia from a country literally languishing in the Dark Ages, a country that had not experienced the Renaissance, a country that had not had a Protestant Reformation, a country that had not had an age of science, a country with no warm water seaports. Peter the Great is going to change all that, literally by the force of his own will. Um, and introduce all kind of other things, a newspaper to Russia. He will introduce the potato to Russia. Uh, he will uh, develop what is called a table of ranks, where a person's rank is assigned to, um, you know, how much service he does for the government. And I bet you can't guess the name of the city in Russia that he built, St. Petersburg that he built thank you he built on a swamp literally dragging all the stones necessary for the construction of the city into the swamp it was said that the city of st petersburg was built upon mud and bones Twenty-five thousand people died in its construction but peter the great was going to have a warm water port Yes, let's push on, shall we? Um, Peter the Great, uh, let's skip her. Ah, yes, Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great of Prussia. Prussian monarch. Uh, he was the one who organized um, and used, well, he started the War of Austrian Succession because he wanted to expand Prussia, the province of Silesia. But now Peter the, uh, sorry, Frederick the Great was a little different. Frederick the Great is what you, he fancied himself as an enlightened despot. He actually, what that mean, uh, the word enlightened despot means smart king. He tried to put forward the idea that he understood the enlightenment and he embraced it. Uh, in fact, he uh, kept a place in his royal court for Voltaire. Uh, and because he wanted to be hip, deaf, and jamming, like me. Uh, but yes, okay, and yes, women, you said you saw, I saw women, yes. Women were also part of the age of uh, 
the sage, beginning with this person. This is Maria Teresa uh, of Austria. Maria Teresa is the daughter of twelve of Charles the Sixth, uh, her father of Austria. When she took power, the aforementioned Peter, rather Frederick the Great of Prussia, launches a war to take her property, and she not only was able to control and save most of her empire, um, but she uh, had ch 12 children and outlived most of them. Yeah, most of them. Uh, but she was a very strong monarch and was able to unite a very polyglot, meaning lots of ethnicities, a multi-ethnic, multi-religion uh, empire like you had with the Austrian Empire. And last but not least, let us not forget Catherine the Great. Now, Catherine the Great actually was not Russian. I'm sorry, Catherine the Great, the Great Tsarina of Russia. Forgive me. Let's see. Maria Theresa was of Austria. Frederick the Great was of Prussia. Forgive me for not mentioning that. Catherine the Great was the great uh, Russian empress who was not Russian. Born a minor princess of Germany uh, with beautiful woman, black hair, dark eyes. Uh, she is married, and once again, we're not talking about dating here. The marriage was arranged to the grandson of Peter the Great, Peter the Third, who was a bumbling fool. I mean, literally, the guy was... Uh, and he was another example of where the Romanov family probably married their own cousins way too much. Yeah, Peter the Third um, liked to dress up in military costumes, liked to imagine that he was a, you know, uh, a military commander of some kind, and he would also dress up rats that he captured uh, in military uniform. And um, in fact, one of the nights he surprised Catherine the Great, he surprised Catherine uh, with one rat who he accused of being a traitor. And Peter had him hanged there in the bedroom. Yeah, so Catherine the Great marries this bozo. And according to most historians, she, she consummated, had sex, consummated the marriage only enough to produce an heir. And then as soon as she had the heir, whose name will be Paul, she began plotting with the first of her officially, I mean, and Catherine the Great had an insatiable sexual appetite. Don't tell anybody. Um, 27 lovers during her lifetime. The most famous one was Gregory Orlov, one of the commanders of the Russian army. It seems that Russia was engaged in a war with Prussia when Russia was under the control of Peter III. And Peter III loved Frederick the Great, who was the king of Prussia. The thing of it was, the Russian army was literally banging on the doors of Berlin, the capital, and almost about to take control of the city, almost about to win this great victory. And Peter the Third um, says, uh, "You know what, guys? Why don't we just not do this anymore? I mean, come on, man! It's Frederick. I mean, he's my hero, and he was. Frederick the Great was Peter, Peter the Third's hero. And Gregory Orloff and a member, a few members of the general staff, uh, beat Peter the Third to death, and then made out that his death was." through some illness or something. Catherine the Great then went on to rule in her husband's stead. She expanded the size of Russia and ruled for quite a long time before she uh, finally died of a stroke. Yeah, I mean, if you really read her, her, uh, her biography, she began, of course, began, to, like we all do, began to get old and being a very beautiful and vibrant woman in her youth and, of course, having 27 official, and these lovers, she had 27 lovers, she paid them. In fact, they would occupy an apartment right next to her chambers, and when 
she was done with them, you know, got tired of them, she would then uh, basically just shoo them away, give them some kind of pension. In fact, one of them, she even made king of Poland. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, she did not, was not happy with getting old. And um, there was one night that her daughter was supposed to marry the son of the king of Sweden. And the son of the king of Sweden decides not to show up and she had a stroke. And uh, then had a subsequent stroke a few months later, and she died. Uh, interestingly enough, she died right about the same time as George Washington. And just like George Washington, um, they bled her in her death. And you know what, guys? I think I've taught way too much. I, know, I see your teachers rolling their eyes and saying, who does this guy think he is? It has been wonderful talking to you. And uh, hopefully we'll get to talk again soon. With that, I would say good night. Adieu. Uh, parting is such sweet sorrow. Uh, right there. Yes.